And it is now time to introduce the author of this book and a good friend and the main keynote speaker for this morning, Stephen Kotler of the Flow Genome Project. Stephen, come on up. All right. Good morning, everyone. Oh, you gotta swap that up. So uh, while that's going on, so the first time Dave and I got together six, seven months ago, and it was, you know, it was one of those lot of synergy in the room, kind of love at first sight kind of thing. And and I'm probably not the only one who's had this experience. We met in a bar, and maybe an hour and a half later, I was half naked in his hotel room. Of course, I was half naked, so he could pump me full of supplements and run electricity through my shoulder with some kind of car battery to repair my broken rotator cuff. And I was absolutely certain it wouldn't work. And the next morning, I was so certain it wouldn't work, I went, like, got up, my shoulders still hurt. And by the way, he was heckling me the entire time, just questioning my manhood. He's like, I, my grandmother can take more juice than you. Next morning, woke up, went to the gym, could lift 40 more pounds with my left shoulder than I had been able to in the previous six months. And that was after one treatment with his miracle weird machine. <laughs> oh. Sure. Um, which I think is kind of a testament to why we're all here. Um, how do we get more out of our body? How do we get more out of ourselves? How do we get more out of our mind? How do we get more out of PowerPoint? What are you doing? I'm just checking your uh, resolution. All right. Um, so while he's setting that up, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to talk about today, which is ultimate human performance, right? I'm going to talk about what is actually possible for our species, and more importantly, what is possible for everybody in this room. And before we kind of dive in, I want to tell you how I want to tell you how to work PowerPoint. Are we good? Okay, cool. When I was 30 years old, so about 17 years ago, I got Lyme disease and spent the better portion of three years in bed. And since you're Dave Asprey fans, you're probably aware of what Lyme disease does to you. But if you're not, it's sort of like the worst flu you've ever had crossed with paranoid schizophrenia. So I was, my, my bodily function was completely reduced. I could barely walk across a room. Mentally, I was gone. And after about three years of this, the doctors had pulled me off drugs, my stomach lining was bleeding out, and there was really not much more anybody thought they could do for me. And I was functional, lucid, clear-headed, able to work, able to do anything for about 45 minutes to an hour a day. And that's obviously no way to live, and the only thing I was gonna be from that point forward was a burden to my friends and my family, so I decided that I was gonna kill myself because it was a logical thing to do under the circumstances, at least to me after three years of Lyme disease. And in the middle of those really, really dark, dark thoughts, and I was pretty serious about it, a friend of mine showed up at my house and demanded that we go surfing. And it was a totally ridiculous request. I couldn't walk across a room, as I said. I could barely move, I could barely think. And it had been about five years since I'd actually been surfing. And the last time I had gone surfing, I had nearly drowned in a big wave accident in Indonesia and wanted nothing else to do with the sport. But my friend was a pain in the butt, and she wouldn't leave my apartment and wouldn't leave and wouldn't leave. And after hours of it, I was like, you know what? We will go surfing today. I can always kill myself tomorrow. <laughs> and they literally, like, they had to carry me to the car, and they loaded me into the car, and we drove to Sunset Beach in Los Angeles. And if you know anything about surfing in LA, you'll know that Sunset Beach is the wimpiest beginner wave in the world. And the, the tide was super low, and it was a hot day. And they gave me a board the size of a Cadillac. And the bigger the board, the easier it is to surf. And they walked me out to the break, literally by my elbows. And I sat out there about 30 seconds. 
and a wave came. And I don't know what it was, muscle memory took over, but I spun my board around, paddled a couple times and popped up to my feet, and I popped up into a totally different dimension. Absolutely strange experience. I popped to my feet, my senses were incredibly heightened, time had slowed to an absolute crawl, that freeze frame effect. If you've ever been in a car crash or seen the matrix? My vision felt panoramic. It felt like I could see out of the back of my head. And the weirdest thing about the entire experience was that I felt great. I mean, for the first time in three years, I actually felt alive. I felt good. I felt like I could clear-headed, I could use my brain, and it felt so good that wave, I caught four more that day. And by the fifth wave, I was totally done. I was disassembled. They drove me home. People put me into bed, and they had to bring me food for about two weeks because I couldn't walk to my kitchen to make a meal. But on the 15th day, which was the day kind of I was strong enough, I caught another ride to the ocean. Again, I had this quasi-mystical, very strange altered state experience. And over the course of about six to eight months, when the only thing I was really doing in my life besides kind of lying on the couch and moaning was going surfing. It's the only thing I changed and over six months I went from about 10% functionality to about 80% functionality. And you know, the first question was, right, what the hell is going on, right? Because surfing is not a known cure for chronic autoimmune conditions. Worse, Lyme is only fatal if it gets into your brain. I'm trained as a science writer. I'm a hardcore rational materialist. I don't have quasi-mystical experiences, and I certainly don't have them while surfing. Nothing could be flakier in my mind, so I was absolutely certain I kept having these experiences in the waves because the Lyme had gotten into my brain, and while I was actually feeling better, I was really dying. So I lit out on you know, a giant quest to figure out what the hell was going on with me, and the first thing I discovered is that this very peculiar state of consciousness I had been experiencing out in the waves had a name. And the name researchers prefer is a flow state, and we'll talk about why in a second, but most of you probably know it by other names. Runner's high, being in the zone. If you're a jazz musician, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, they called it being in the pocket. If you're a basketball player today, you call it being unconscious. Stand-up comics prefer the for forever box. Flow is the term that scientists prefer, so that's the term I'm going to stick with. And I'm, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this experience. Flow describes those moments of total absorption. We get so absorbed by the task at hand, by what we're doing, that everything else disappears. Your sense of self, your sense of self-consciousness vanishes completely. Time dilates, which is a fancy way of saying it passes strangely. Sometimes you get that freeze frame slowdown effect that I described. Other times, five hours will pass by in like five minutes. And throughout all aspects of performance, mental and physical, go through the roof. So flow science stretches back about 150 years. But in the 60s and 70s, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who was then chairman of the University of Chicago Psychology Department, he's now at Drucker, did what was what we would now consider the largest global happiness study ever done. He was actually looking at well-being, and there's a difference, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, he went around the world asking people at the times in their life that they felt their best and they performed their best. And this was kind of our, the fundamental flow study, and he learned four things that are really important. The first thing he learned is flow is ubiquitous. It shows up everywhere in anyone, provided certain initial conditions are met. He discovered that flow is a spectrum experience. So there are seven or eight characteristics that psychologically describe the state of flow. Focus, concentration, merger of action and awareness, loss of self, time dilation, on and on. You can have a state of micro flow when a couple of these variables show up, or you can have macro flow, which is that full quasi-mystical experience that I kept having while surfing. Flow functions essentially like any other emotion, right? Anger can be a little bit irked, homicidally murderous, same emotion. Flow works the same way. It is a spectrum experience. And most people, by the way, spend about 5% of their work life in microflow without even knowing it. That's just on average. Csikszentmihalyi also discovered that when he went around the world asking people about this state, about the times in their life when they felt their best and they performed their best, 
The reason we call flow flow is when people were describing the experience, they would say, well, everything is perfect. Every action, every decision leaves seamlessly, fluidly to the next. In other words, flow feels flowy. And that word kept coming up, so that is where the state got its name. So in the state, as I mentioned earlier, mental and physical abilities go through the roof. Physically, we are stronger, we are faster, we are more dexterous, we are more agile, but so are our brains. In flow, we are taking in more information per second, we are processing it more deeply, and people are arguing about this still, but it does appear we are processing it more quickly. Flow does more than just kind of boost information processing in the brain. It jacks up pattern recognition. It amplifies future prediction. All of the basic neuronal processes in the brain are amplified by flow. Which is why, if you talk to researchers today, they will tell you that most gold medals, world championships, have a flow state underneath them. Flow accounts for significant progress in the arts, major scientific breakthroughs. McKinsey just finished a 10-year study. They found top executives in flow are five times more productive than out of flow. Five times more productive is 500% more productive. It means you could go to work on Monday, spend Monday in flow, take Tuesday through Friday off, and get as much done as your steady state peers. Now that 500% boost in performance probably sounds a little ridiculous. It is, after all, a fairly big number. So I want to give you an example of what that looks like in the real world. For reasons that I'll get to in a minute, today's action and adventure sport athletes, surfers, skiers, snowboarders, rock climbers, mountain bikers, have become some of the best flow hackers on Earth. They've gotten better at precipitating the state of flow reliably and repeatedly than probably anybody in the history of the world. And we'll talk about why in a second. But first I want to show you what that 500% boost in performance looks like over time. In the past 25 years, for this reason, if you look at action and adventure sports like a data set, what you see is nearly exponential growth in ultimate human performance. Ultimate human performance is defined as performance when life or limb is on the line. Common sense tells you it's the slowest possible line to progress, and yet it's progressed nearly exponentially, right? Nothing like this has ever happened before. Sports performance, sports progression, it is slow, it is steady, it is governed by the laws of evolution. At no point in history does it quintuple in a decade, and that's exactly what's happening all over action and adventure sports. And I'll give you two quick examples. Surfing is about a thousand year old sport. And from 400 AD to 1996, the biggest wave anybody had ever surfed is 25 feet. Above that, surfers, scientists, everybody believes it's impossible. There are physics papers written about how it's impossible to surf a wave over 25 feet. Today, we're pushing into waves that are over 100 feet tall. In snowboarding, if you go back to 1992, the biggest gap jump anybody had ever cleared was 40 feet. Now, 40 feet is large. It's two buses stacked end to end. Today, about 16 years later, we're clearing gaps over 250 feet. It's a skyscraper. We've gone from a small house to a skyscraper in about 16 years. And all of it has happened because of flow. And I want to talk about what's really going in, on in flow. I want to give you a look under the hood and talk about what's the changes in the brain and the body that make all this accelerated performance possible. So we're gonna talk a little bit about neuroscience. And to actually understand flow and the neuroscience of flow, you kinda of need to know three things. You need to understand a little bit of neuroanatomy, which is where in the brain something is taking place. You need to know a little bit about neurochemistry and neuroelectricity, which are the two ways the brain communicates with itself. And we're gonna sort of, we're gonna leave neuroelectricity out of it just for time purposes, but we're gonna start with neuroanatomy, where in the brain something takes place. The old idea about ultimate performance, and I'm probably I'm certain that pretty much everybody in the room has heard of this, is what's known as the 10% brain myth. This is the idea that we're only using 10% of our brain at any one time, and ultimate performance, optimal performance flow, must be the whole brain firing on all cylinders. Turns out that's not the case at all. Turns out we had it exactly backwards. 
inflow parts of the brain aren't becoming hyperactive, they're deactivating, they're shutting down. The technical term for this is transient, meaning temporary, hypo, H-Y-P-O, it's the opposite of hyper, means to slow down, to shut down, to deactivate, frontality, which is the front part of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, where all of your higher cognitive functions are housed. So your prefrontal cortex is your morality, your sense of will, your complex decision-making abilities. Large swatches of the prefrontal cortex shut down in flow. So why does time pass so strangely in a flow state? Because it turns out time is calculated all over the prefrontal cortex, and as parts of it start to wink out, we can no longer separate past from present from future, and we're plunged into what scientists call the deep now. Another part of your brain that gets shut down in flow is the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is an incredible part of your brain because it's the part of your brain that produces your inner critic. That nagging, defeatist, always on voice in your head shuts down in flow. It goes quiet. This is why we, we feel our sense of self disappears in flow. But when this goes quiet, we experience this as, as liberation, as relief. Creativity goes up, risk taking goes up. We are finally free of ourselves, basically. We are getting out of our own way. Flow is also the product of complicated neurochemistry. In flow, five of the most potent neurochemicals the brain can produce show up, and this is the only time you can get all five at once. Now, all five of these neurochemicals are performance-enhancing chemicals, but they do more than just enhance performance. All five of these chemicals are the most pleasurable reward drugs the brain can produce. And just to give you an idea, so you get dopamine. Cocaine is widely considered the most addictive substance on Earth. All that happens when people use cocaine, most of what happens when people use cocaine, is it releases a tremendous amount of dopamine into the brain and then blocks its reuptake. You also get norepinephrine in flow. Norepinephrine is the endogenous, the internal form of speed. You get serotonin, which is the internal form of MDMA. You get anandamide, which is the same as the psychoactive that shows up in marijuana. And you get endorphins. And the most common, which are opiates, like morphine and heroin, yet the most commonly produced endorphin in the body is 100 times more powerful than medical morphine, which is a very fancy way of saying flow is the most addictive state on Earth. Now, researchers don't like the word addictive. It has very negative connotations. So instead, they call flow autotelic. When something is autotelic, it is an end in itself. What all this means is that once an experience starts producing flow, we will go extraordinarily far out of our way to get more of it. When, I'll give you a couple of examples. Surfers are not known as the most motivated group of people in history. We can say that safely, right? As a surfer, I can say that. Um, yet, if there are overhead tubes at Malibu, people are in the parking lot at 4 a.m., putting on cold, wet suits, paddling through freezing water to get more flow, to get a taste. Computer coding, software coding, is another activity that is known to produce a tremendous amount of flow. And we'll talk about why in a second. But when the coders stay up, three days to finish a project, it is not warm beer and cold pizza that is keeping them going, right? This is what flow looks like in action. This is a very big deal. Gallup just did a poll. They found 71% of American workers are disengaged or actively disengaged on the job. Actively disengaged, by the way, is my favorite euphemism ever. It means I hate what I do so much, I'm gonna sabotage the company. 71% of us, so almost three out of four of us, hate what we do with the majority of our time, right? The other 25%, 29%, have jobs that produce flow and they love what they do. They can't wait to get back to work. So earlier, we talked about what McKinsey found, right? A 500% boost in performance. When you look under the hood of that boosted performance, one of the things you see is this massively accelerated motivation. And it's the neurochemistry that produces that. 
the neurochemistry does something else that's pretty spectacular. Boosts creativity at a really fundamental level. So we had an old idea of creativity, right? Intuitive creativity it popped in our head that came out of nowhere and we didn't understand it. Turns out, as we all probably know now, that is not the case, right? Creativity is always recombinatory. The product of new ideas bumping into old thoughts to create something startlingly new. It's a recombinatory process. The neurochemicals that show up and flow surround this process. So at the front end of the flow state, Remember when I told you about going surfing and my senses seemed incredibly heightened? It's actually norepinephrine and dopamine tightening focus. My pattern recognition system is taking in more information per second, right? So the front end of the creative process is lots of novelty, lots of new information that's heightened because of norepinephrine and dopamine. In the middle of the creative process, you have ideas linking together. Well, norepinephrine and dopamine do something else that's really cool. They lower signal to noise ratios in the brain, which is a fancy way of saying they jack up pattern recognition. So you get more ideas linking together. And andamine, another of the neurochemicals that show up in flow, boosts lateral thinking. Lateral thinking is disparate ideas bumping into each other. So you are taking in more information and you are making more connections between that information. Flow surrounds the creative process. This is why in really unofficial, and then we'll talk about an official study, but in a really unofficial study run by my organization, Flow Genome Project, people will report creativity boosted by 500 to 700% in flow. Interestingly, Teresa Amable at Harvard figured out that that heightened creativity actually outlasts the flow state itself, and people will report that heightened creativity a day to two days after a flow state. In a recent study run in Australia, they took 42 people, they gave them a really tricky brain teaser to solve, this kind that needs really creative problem solving. Nobody could solve the problem. They induced flow artificially using transcranial magnetic stimulation. They basically shot a big electromagnetic pulse through people's frontal cortex and knocked it out. It was artificial transient hypofrontality. 23 people solved the problem in record time. Flow boosts motivation it massively jacks up creativity. Finally, these neurochemicals play one other role. They massively increase learning. So a quick shorthand for learning is the more neurochemicals that show up during experience, the better chance that experience has of moving from short-term holding into long-term storage. Right? Neurochemicals, one of their functions is essentially to be a huge neon tag on experience saying important save for later. Because flow is a really potent dump of these five neurochemicals, <coughs> they massively jack up learning, which is why neuroscientists with DARPA and advanced brain monitoring in Carlsbad, California figured out that snipers in flow, military training snipers in flow, learned 230% faster than normal. They then repeated that study with novice marksmen, both archers and riflemen. They found absolute novices could be trained up to experts in 50% less time by inducing flow. Which is to say Malcolm Gladwell's famous 10,000 hours to mastery, right? What the research shows is that flow cuts it in half. So when we talk about that 500% boost in performance, we talk about what's going on in action and adventure sports, one of the reasons everything's going so crazy is because you have massively accelerated learning, creativity, and motivation. And just because you're probably wondering, neurochemicals do one other thing. All the neurochemicals that show up in flow boost the immune system. So how did I use flow to get over Lyme disease, right? My original question. All the neurochemicals that show up in flow boost the immune system, and more importantly, they reset the nervous system. They flush the stress hormones out of the body, so Lyme is essentially, or in any autoimmune condition, is essentially a nervous system gone haywire, right? So flow resets it, it calms it back down, and then it boosted my immune system, and it really basically gave my body the space to heal. So that is, that is how that happened, in case you were wondering. Usually, by this point, most people are wondering, okay, this flow stuff sounds great, I have one question, how the hell do I get more of it, right? This is where those action and adventure sport athletes have come in really 
handy. So we have made a tremendous amount of progress in neuroscience in the past 20 years, right? We can look farther into the brain than ever before. One of the problems Flow Research had is while we've got very good, really extremely well-validated psychological subjective measures of flow, we don't have many biophysical measures of flow. What these athletes gave us is the level of performance has gone up so high in action and adventure sports that they can't really do what they're doing, the top athletes, without flow. So we suddenly knew if our research subjects were in flow, if they survived, they were in the state. So it gave us a really hard data set which with to work. And using this data and all the advances in neurobiology, we have worked backwards and we've discovered some really fundamental things about flow hacking. One thing that we've discovered is that flow has 17 triggers. These are preconditions that bring on more flow. There are three external triggers, call them environmental triggers, things in the environment that will drive us deeper into flow. There are three internal or psychological triggers, things that we can use to modify our own internal environment to drive us deeper into flow. There's one creative trigger and there's 10 social triggers. And I'll give you a look at a few more of them. So I'm not gonna talk about all the triggers today, um, but I will show you a slide share URL where you can get a whole document about all of them free of charge. So there's more information coming, but I do wanna talk about three environmental triggers for a number of reasons. One, because action and adventure sport athletes have relied on these triggers more than almost anything else to trigger flow. And I know one thing that happens, because I've been talking about this stuff enough, is that usually when I start talking about action and adventure sport athletes, people tune out. They think, okay, I don't risk my life for a living, so this doesn't apply to me. So to let you know how much it applies to you, I'm gonna look at how these triggers work in the action and adventure sport environment, and then we'll just move them into the business environment, and we'll take a look at how they might work there. So of these three triggers, the first, well, before I do that, the first thing I need to tell you is that flow is always a present tense affair, right? It can only take place in this moment, in the now. So under the hood, what all of these triggers are is they're focusing mechanisms. They're ways of driving attention into the now. More specifically, they are essentially the ways that evolution shaped our brain to pay attention to the present moment, right? So there's a lot of history here and you're essentially just hacking evolutionary biology when you're hacking flow. The first of these triggers is high consequences. This is obvious, right? Flow follows focus, consequences catch our attention. Action adventure sport athletes perform in very high risk environments. This is obvious why they're pulling this trigger all the time. But for those of us who are not interested in physical risk, really good news. You can substitute any other kind of risk. So you can replace physical risk with emotional risk, intellectual risk, creative risk, social risk. Social risk is especially good. You ever wonder, by the way, why public speaking is the number one fear in the world and it's not like getting eaten by a grizzly bear? It's because until about 250 years ago, if you got banished or exiled by your tribe, it was a death sentence. It was a capital punishment. So the brain processes social pain and social fear in the exact same structures it processes physical pain and physical fear. The brain can't really tell the difference. So you do need risk to trigger flow, but it's entirely relative, right? Big wave surfer may have to paddle into a 50 foot wave to pull this trigger. Shy woman only has to raise her hand and speak up at a business meeting to pull this trigger. The shy guy's gotta cross the bar and say hello to the pretty girl to pull this trigger. It's entirely relative and you only have to go after physical risk if you want to. The next trigger is a rich environment. Now a rich environment, hmm, let me jump back to high consequences for just one second. There's a couple things I wanted to mention. The one thing about the high consequences trigger and how it applies in business that you want to pay attention to is it tells you something about Silicon Valley companies with a fail forward, fail faster motto. These are high flow environments. Companies that are not kind of embracing failure, you can't embrace failure in your job, you don't have room to take risk. So you're denying yourself or your employees the advantages you, that comes from flow, right? There's all kinds of other reasons you want kind of risk in business today, rapid iteration, things like that. But by not creating the space for risk taking in an organization, you are not creating space for flow. So 
expect a rich environment. Rich environment is a very fancy way of saying lots of novelty, lots of complexity, and lots of unpredictability in the environment. All three of these things produce flow. Under the hood, much like high consequences, what they actually do is they cause the brain to release dopamine, which helps you slide into the state. But novelty, unpredictability, and complexity are three triggers that we call the rich environment. They all bring on flow, and most people in this room have had some experience with that. If you've looked up at the night sky and seen the vastness of the night sky, or you've gazed at the Grand Canyon, you get sucked in by geological time, and reality seems to pause just for that second, you're totally absorbed. Awe is what we call that. Awe is the front edge of a flow state. That time dilation you get that sucked into the moment, that's the front edge of a flow state. That's the product of a rich environment. Deep embodiment is a fancy way of saying I'm paying attention to all of my sensory streams at once. So deep embodiment is total physical awareness, another very potent flow trigger. And when I say total physical awareness, not just your five senses, you also have vestibular awareness, perception. so that's balance, body position in space, right? All of these things are very, very potent flow triggers. Action and adventure sport athletes pull this trigger all the time because their sports are packed with zero Gs, multiple Gs, and polyaxial rotation, right? Zero Gs, weightlessness, multiple Gs, weightedness, Polyaxial rotation is rotation around one's middle. We are gravity-bound creatures. Whenever we encounter these sensations, it grabs hold of our attention and drives in and out, and it precipitates flow. But you don't actually have to be an action-adventure sport athlete to pull this trigger. Back in the 90s, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi and another researcher, Kevin Rathunde from the University of Utah, went looking for really high-flow environments in the real world that were not action-adventure sport environments. What they discovered was Montessori education. Montessori education is known to produce a tremendous amount of flow, which is one of the reasons researchers believe Montessori kids tend to outperform regular kids on you know, pretty much every intelligence test, social skills test, doesn't really matter. Montessori kids tend to kick butt. And one of the reasons is there's a tremendous amount of flow in Montessori education. And one of the reasons why is they often call Montessori education embodied education which is a fancy way of saying, don't just learning, <laughs> it's a fancy way of saying learning through doing, not just learning through reading, learning through teaching. Don't just read about the windmill, go out and build one, right? By engaging the brain and your hands, multiple senses, you are precipitating flow and you're getting advanced learning as a result. So those are the three environmental triggers and I'm just going to loosely kind of cover the rest. This URL is the free slide here I told you about. There are three psychological triggers. I want to talk about one in particular, it's known as the challenge skills ratio. Most people believe this is the most important flow trigger. So the idea with the challenge skills ratio is that flow shows up when the challenge of the task at hand slightly exceeds our skill set. So you want to stretch but not snap, right? You wanna push hard, but not snap. Number of years ago, Csikszentmihalyi and a Google mathematician sat down and did a back of the envelope calculation and just came to the conclusion that they thought the difference between challenge and skills was roughly 4%. Now this is a nonsense figure, this is not real science, this is an, a guesstimate made by people who knew a lot about flow. We took this guesstimate into the Flow Genome Project and it ran very unofficial, loose, would never publish any of this studies on it just to see if it might even be close to real. Turns out it's pretty damn accurate, as far as we can tell. What's interesting about this 4% gradient, because of course that number doesn't mean anything to this people in this room, is it's tricky. For people who are under-motivated, 4% is tricky because it's the moment you start to get really uncomfortable. You are outside your comfort zone when you're pushing that hard. For people who are bulletproof, who are really motivated, 4% is tricky because you will blow by it. You will take on tasks that are 10% harder, 20% harder, and you're denying yourself the easy access to flow. The challenge skills ratio means that you go slow to go fast. You push slightly harder and slightly harder and slightly harder and slightly harder and slightly harder, and slightly harder to get constant flow. So 
going to leave that. There is one creative trigger, and there are 10 social triggers. And I'm not going to go into anything about that, because there's other things I want to tell you, other than to explain that up till now, we've been talking about individual flow, how individuals can get into the zone. There is also a shared collective version of the experience. It is known as group flow. It is what happens when a group of people go into a flow state together. And again, most of you probably have some experience here. If you've sung in a church choir, if you've played in a band, if you've gone to a rock concert, if you've seen a fourth quarter comeback in football, if you've taken part in a great brainstorming session, this is group flow in action, right? And the same kind of massive amplification of individual performance that you get with flow, you get with group flow because the whole group is elevated. So there are 10 social triggers that precipitate group flow. We're going to leave the triggers for a moment. The final thing I want to tell you about them is what action and adventure sport athletes did to hack flow so successfully. They packed their lives with all 17 of these flow triggers. They essentially, and a lot of this happened unconsciously and inadvertently, but as they were looking for more and more performance, right, because flow is natural, we'll all sort of intuitively drive in this direction, they ended up packing their lives with these 17 flow triggers, and that's one of the major things that produced nearly exponential growth and ultimate human performance these past 25 years. The next thing I want to tell you is probably the most important flow hacking tip I can give you, which is we used to believe flow was a binary, that it worked like a light switch, right? You're either in the zone or you're out of the zone. Not the case at all. We now know that flow is a four part cycle. It is a four stage process. People ask me all the time, they want to live in a perpetual flow state. Not going to happen. Because there's a four stage process you have to get through to get back into flow. And a number of those stages are almost anti-flow. They feel almost the exact opposite of the flow state itself. And in fact, emotional fortitude, having the grit to kind of grind through those harder straits is one of the major keys to flow hacking. So I want to break this down a little bit further for you. On the front end of a flow state is what is known as a struggle phase. Struggle is a loading phase. You are loading, then overloading the brain with information. When you are in a struggle, if you're an athlete, this is skill acquisition. This is I'm learning to keep my eye on the ball. I'm learning to swing the bat. For a writer, for myself, when I'm starting a new book, I'm in struggle when I'm doing hundreds of interviews and I've got Venn diagrams of my possible chapters all over my office and everything's a mess and I'm totally frustrated. And the secret here is you want to take yourself to the brink of absolute madness, just to the point that you're just absolutely got to start screaming, and then you want to stop. You want to move from the struggle phase into the second phase, or the second stage of the flow cycle. Whoa, sorry about that. Which is release. So what happens in flow, we are trading conscious processing, which is very slow, Thought moves at about 150 miles an hour. It is very, very, very energy inefficient. And the brain is always trying to conserve energy, right? It's at rest, it uses 25% of your energy, but it's roughly 2% of your body mass. So the brain is always, always, always trying to conserve energy. And there's very limited RAM, right? Your working memory, most of us can only hold on to four items at once. So you want to trade conscious processing for subconscious processing. Flow is essentially the only time that we get to watch our subconscious mind drive the bus. And it's astounding, right? First of all, the subconscious is incredibly energy efficient, right? So you burn up much less energy. It is very, very, very fast. Numbers vary depending where you are, but two to 5,000 times faster than conscious thought. And we have really no idea how much RAM the subconscious mind has. We can't find the limit of it yet, right? So the brain wants to trade conscious processing for subconscious processing. To do this, you essentially have to take your mind off the problem. To get into release, you have to be thinking about it all day, and then you have to go do something else. And there are certain things that work better than others. You want kind of low-skill physical tasks, building models. Model airplanes work really, really well. Gardening works really, really well. Walks work very well. Albert Einstein famously used to row a boat into the middle of Lake Geneva and stare at the clouds. About the only thing that doesn't work super well here is watching television. Television will alter your brainwaves in such a way that it will block the flow state. 
almost everything else. The other, uh, the other end of that is you don't want to work out so hard that you're exhausted. You don't want to totally exhaust yourself. But almost anything else will work, right? And release, once you can take your mind off the problem, once the subconscious mind can get a hold of the problem, it will kick you into the flow state itself. Flow state is the third stage of the strike cycle. It is a huge, oh my god, I feel great. I feel like Superman. You can do anything. Height and performance, all of it, it's great. And then it's followed by a hard low. In the back end of the flow state is the recovery phase. So flow is a very expensive neurobiological process, right? It takes a lot of energy. The neurochemicals that are released takes a certain amount of nutrition. Right? The brain is always trying to hoard neurochemistry. It takes a little while for these chemicals to reboot. It takes a little while for the brain to reboot. So you go from this magical high of, I feel like Superman, this deep low, right? A lot of people, there's a dark side to flow. It, you're playing with addictive neurochemistry, and this is a deep, deep low. And you have to really learn to kind of grit your teeth through it. I always tell people that the, the best way to understand how to get through uh, the recovery phase and flow is the hangover rule applies. And the hangover rule, as anybody who's been drunk more than three times knows, is that when you're hungover, you get all kinds of negative nonsense in your brain. Your brain tells you all kinds of stuff. And if you, get, if you have any practice with this, you don't pay any attention to it. You're like, yeah, yeah, I, I know I'm, I'm ugly and I'm slow and I'm stupid, but I'm going to deal with those problems tomorrow because today I'm hungover, right? Same thing with the low of flow. And the reason it's so important to kind of have this emotional fortitude through recovery is twofold. One is if you start to stress out over not feeling in flow, right? You don't have any more happy drugs in the body for a little while. And so if you attach to that and start to stress out, you will start to produce cortisol. A little bit is okay. Start to produce too much, it is going to block the accelerated learning you get in the flow state. So while you may get the short-term performance boost, you're not going to get the long-term effects of flow. Equally important, if you want more flow in your life, right, if the whole point is to maximize this state in your life, you have to move from recovery right back into struggle. So if you are really depressed at no longer being in flow and when you're in recovery, it is hard to get up for the serious fight of struggle. It is difficult to do. One of the things, one of the reasons action and adventure sport athletes got so good at flow hacking Again, it has almost nothing to do with them and everything to do with luck, but their sports are very, very, very weather dependent. In almost every action and adventure sport, big storm moves in, everybody goes surfing or skiing or snowboarding, and then it goes away, and people take a couple days off. They recover on the back end, and this allows them to maximize flow, and it's one of the things that allow them to achieve so much performance, right? This doesn't happen much in the real world, right? As a general rule, our rewards for doing something really, really difficult, right, for figuring out how to get into flow and achieving something really, really difficult is usually immediately when you're done with it, somebody walks in and says, oh, that was phenomenal, that was great, can you do it again only in half the time and double your quotas and blah, 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 right? We're not given time to recover and that acceleration, it changes the challenge skills ratio. So not only are we not given time to recover, the reward for getting in flow and doing something great is greater responsibility. And sometimes it's too much, right? And it kicks us out of that challenge skills balance. It's a challenge too big. These two factors show up again and again in organizations. It's one of the mistakes organizations make all the time with flow. So we are at the very front end of this research. There's about 150 years worth of psychology done, right? There's about 20, 25 years of neurobiology on flow that's been done. Physiology, what's going on in the body. So psychology, mind. Neurobiology, brain. Physiology, body. Physiology is kind of a black hole when it comes to flow. One of the main reasons is we haven't had the measurement devices we've needed until very, very, very recently. Um, one of the reasons we're all in this room is because those measurement devices have finally caught up to us. So my organization, the Flow Genome Project, 
our goal, what we are really trying to do, is to map the psychology onto the neurobiology, onto the physiology, to create what we're loosely calling a heat map for flow. It may be clear by now, everybody has different on-ramps into flow, right? You can take creativity into the zone. You can ride risk into the zone. There is an altruism-based flow state. It's known as helper's high. It was discovered by Alan Lukes, who founded Big Brother, Big Sister back in the 90s. He discovered this very, very, very potent flow high produced by the act of helping another. So everybody has these different gateways into flow. We believe that a heat map of flow will basically allow everybody to figure out where they're located and maximize the amount of flow in their lives. To tell you a little bit more about what the work we're doing in a couple of seconds, I'm going to bring up my partner at the Flow Genome Project, our executive director, Jamie Wheel. You will see that we've taken over the exhibition hall, the back end of the exhibition hall. Come on up. Um, here, and we've got um, our first world inaugural flow dojo. These are our dedicated flow research and training facilities. This is the very first one in history. We built it specifically for you guys. And you guys are going to get to play on it, and Jamie's going to tell you a little bit about it. So thanks for listening. Good morning, everybody. Great to be here and uh, really honored and delighted to be able to debut our first pop-up activation. This is a world premiere of the Flow Dojo content and couldn't think of a better community uh, to get to share it with. So by all means, through the course of the weekend, uh, I would imagine that the group flow experience that Stephen alluded to uh, a few minutes ago is something that's going to start happening at this conference itself. And for anybody that's been at a really great, memorable conference, I mean, the, the classic thing is it's, it's less what happens on stage, and it's more what happens in the hallway, it's more what happens at meals, all those kinds of things. So let's really consider this an invitation and permission to get our collective flow on. And certainly, if you need a booster shot, um, come by and check out some of the toys and games. Because in the biohacking and neurohacking community, um, we have an issue, right? Big data has been kind of the sexy darling of press and media in the last several years. And what we're realizing, not surprisingly, is that human nature hasn't changed, even if our, even if our processing power in the cloud has. And at this point in time, we really are drowning in information. We've got binders full of data, right? And yet, what we do with our actual intrinsic drives, we know better now. How come we aren't doing better? And for us, that, that's where the flow comes in, is that for most of us, motivation on change, motivation on growth, motivation on improvement, often, if we really strip it down, comes from some fairly unsustainable sources. It often comes from guilt or vanity. Right? Even just think about physical exercise as a really concrete example. Why do we work out? For most of us, it's because I was a lazy bastard sitting on the couch eating Doritos Cool Ranch all Sunday, and now I need to go out for my Monday morning run of atonement, right? Or vanity, oh yeah, I still want to fit in my high school jeans. And neither of those is anywhere near as sustainable as what Stephen was talking about is that autotelic component of flow states. Bottom line is life is short, let's have fun, right? And how can we leverage the things we can't not be compelled to do? in service of our life and growth. And to put a point on this, there was a Harvard study. When faced with cataclysmic mortal death, you have a lifestyle-affiliated disease, so diabetes, hypertension, obesity, any of those kinds of things that we can change, smoking. And you were told you will die if you don't change. Right? One in seven people opted for change. Six out of seven of us said I'd rather die, quite literally, than change what I do. So back to these guys for a moment. There has been something pretty fascinating that's been happening in the last decade. This code has been cracked by two particular communities of practice. One is special operations military forces, and the other is the extreme athletes that Stephen was alluding to. And certainly Red Bull um, and their stable of athletes are arguably pushing this specific approach further and faster than anybody. Uh, the trick is there's a, there's a built-in disincentive, right? One of those groups wants to stay a step ahead of the bad guys, so they're not saying anything. And the other group wants to stay a step up on the podium. So both of these communities of advanced practice have a vested interest in keeping it to themselves. 
And one of our stated goals is to take the extreme to the mainstream and make this available for the rest of us. So this is, this is an early uh, kind of rendition of what that, tr what that playground, what that training center is going to look and feel like. And you guys get to poke around with some of our, um, some of our beta products and, and get to play with them and see what they work with. But basically the idea is what happens if we combine the kind of Montessori learning for grown-ups, right, but with our kinetics, with our bodies and our brains instead of with science. So take the exploratorium idea, hands-on science, and make it hands-on embodied cognition and make it joyful, delightful, and playful. And can we launch the world's first dedicated research and training facility to flow states? Because to Stephen's earlier point, you know, flow sounds awesome. How do I get more? Right? We can't all be Dave Asprey building our own biohacking labs or Peter Thiel spend dropping a quarter of a million bucks on a personal nutritionist. Right? So what happens as a community when we can get together and crowdsource what's next right, in the furthest reaches of human performance? And just to take a look at what that looks like on the inside, right? The ability to suspend the consequences of gravity, right? Gravity hurts, it really does. And when Stephen was talking about weightlessness and weightedness and rotation, all those things are awesome, right? Our brains and our bodies love that stuff. And gravity hurts. So most of us, especially after a certain, you know, late teens to, you know, wild and woolly early 20s, we give up on that stuff. We back away from it. Because the, the, the penalties for getting it wrong are too high. So what happens if we can make equipment that lets us experience sensory motor inputs that let us train our brains, right, and do it safely and do it scalably and also have the biofeedback and the data? So I want to announce this is a community effort. This is we are simply uh, literally building the bigger tent to have this conversation. Um, there's tons of awesome folks, both in light and sound folks, that have been on to design the, the Star Trek bridge for the films, the Tron movie, uh, Batman, the Super Bowl halftime shows, those guys have been busting their butts on all of our tools and toys. So when you guys come back there and you see light and sound and accelerometers and biometrics and all that kind of stuff, that, that's the amazing folks from Toy Shop Labs in LA. Uh, Sense Labs, uh, Dr. Leslie Sheerlin, who is building some of the best EEG sensors, has created the world's first flow protocol for EEGs, which you guys will get to use and play on when you come by. Heart math doing cardiac coherence, so what is my respiratory state and cardiac state, right, so I can be most resourceful. Muse headbands, Zephyr sensors, which are basically under the Under Armour E39 vest, if you've seen that kind of Iron Man compression shirt that those guys wear in the NFL combine. So you guys get to try this stuff and play with it and really see what is it like, right, when we take body and brain, when we train our bodies and our brains to find our minds. So with that, that's the goal, right? This is, this is the collective here. What's the point of all this hacking of bio things, right? And arguably, it's to go from altered states, right? I've just slammed down a double bulletproof coffee, and I feel great, right? To altered traits. Who do we become? What can we do once we're looking around at each other in community, in practice, with good work to be done? And I think that brings us just back to that fantastic new logo and the bulletproof dove, right? What is possible when we actually get serious about this, when we stop treating it as a novelty or a distraction, some kind of World of Warcraft geekery with like, mm, you know, I've got, I've got 43 shield hit points, right, with my new brain octane. Forget it. What's the point? And hopefully the point is for us to all to get together, train our games, and give our gifts fully, freely, and with maximum impact. So with that, I want to give the stage back to Stephen, open this. In fact, I'll tell you what, guys. Let's just do a seventh inning stretch. Can everyone just stand up? We've been seated for way the hell too long. Literally, reach up. Mm. Extend, crack your backs, do what you need to. And Stephen's going to come on up and just have a quick round of Q&As, the Rise of Superman book, the talk, anything to do with uh, the Flow Genome Project. And we will see you guys next door. Have a wonderful conference. Thank you very much. The little clock on the floor tells me I get to take two questions. So two questions. In the back. They'll bring you a microphone, I think. Uh, thank you very much. I'm um, curious about the, any like down regulatory effects that happen in flow state 
and the important role of that recovery phase. And if you've done any research or found anything that says that going like somehow deeper into the recovery phase allows you to go deeper into flow state. It's a great question. Um, I don't, and it's a question, I, the, the short answer is I have no idea. <laughs> the, uh, the slightly longer answer is what we have discovered about, about recovery and what does seem to be true is that the more kind of respectful you are of your body, the more you really kind of repower up, you need a lot of protein, blah, 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 all take care of your body in that phase, the quicker you can move into flow again. Um, I, the, the depth of the flow experience versus the depth of the recovery state, I don't even, not, not only don't I think it has been studied, I don't think I've ever heard anybody ask the question before, so it's a great question, I just don't know. So next, sorry, that was disappointing. <laughs> I, either. You guys can arm wrestle for it. This is just quick. Um, I teach CrossFit, so, and, and for a lot of us, we know that CrossFit is a very intense way of working out. Uh, one of my questions was, I have a lot of athletes who cannot get into that intense state unless they have loud news, music blaring at them. Is that anything to do with the brain and the flow state, if you've done any research on music and performance? I was also a dancer, a professional dancer, so I understand that from you know, coming on stage, that whole feeling was incredible. But from an athletic point of view, have you done any research on that? Yeah, there's actually, there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of research um, on, on music and flow. There's definitely overlaps with sound. Um, iPods, <laughs> it's blocking out the world, right? You're trying to drive attention into the now, right? You're trying to shut down the prefrontal cortex. You can, pumping really loud music into the brain doesn't allow you to think, and it kind of drives, it can work. It, it can go against, if heavy metal isn't your thing, right? It's gonna keep you out of the, out of the zone because it's gonna push the challenge skills ratio in a way that you don't wanna go. So it's gotta, you know, if you're in a CrossFit class and there's different tastes of music, it's not gonna work the same for everybody. Um, we, one of the things that you'll see uh, d next door is we have an Art of Flow video that has some brainwave entrainment music kind of underneath it to kind of nudge you towards flow. Sort of works, sort of doesn't, but it's, you know, it's in a beta stage and it is starting to get you there. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Jamie. Sorry we had to cut that a little bit short. If you guys have questions for Stephen and Jamie, they're going to be next door the whole weekend. I would definitely recommend trying out all of their crazy technology. It is exhilarating.